come back. Um, so today I'm going to continue talking about what we latest QCD can do for the EIC physics. I'm going to skip that. Uh, so one important announcement, some of you are asking about the t-shirt. Uh, so you can still do this. If you complete all the label of content due before Monday, um, 8 a.m. That's when we're going to check that. Uh, so if you finish all that, um, you take a photo. Here's an example. Uh, the, the, first come, the first winner who come to me this morning, uh, they answer a few of the questions in the Google form and upload a photo for you. Could be, it would be nice since you, you guys are in the school somewhere in this building. That's a nice background would be great. Uh, and then there's just a few photos. I, I need a proof that you finish that. <laughs> it could be this, this screenshot, another screenshot, that's fine. And the phone will have a question for you to consent that when we have a website in the future, whether we can put your photo on our wall of fan for all those people who finish that. If you don't want to, it's fine. That we just have that as a record, you complete that. And so what I'm gonna do is collect all these information and hopefully I have enough t-shirt for everyone who completed this. And then I'm gonna mail that to Fred. Uh, hopefully, on Wednesday, hopefully arrive on Wednesday, Thursday, so that he can distribute all this t-shirt to those who finish that. Okay, so if you have time on the train, you got bored, play around with that, uh, or something else, any time you good. Okay, so that's that. Um, so today I'd like to continue and move on talking about things about the structure, right? So when we start, start want to really look at something that's very small, right? we build a microscope. And typically, you can see a lot of biology within the reasonable, you know, wavelength of light. When we go on to see something a lot smaller, you need to build your much bigger microscope, and that's why we all we learned a lot of uh, a lot of technology this morning. And then uh, there are something that's already ongoing, but the, the, the future EIC is going to tell us a lot more on um, what's missing in the current experiments. And so, uh, so one of the this is one of the diagrams you saw this morning from the. Uh, Deeply in the last scattering uh, that we can study a lot of different hadron structures, especially photon, which make up many of us. Right. And so generally speaking, there are few type of observable that we study on the lattice. And so we study something called strut. Uh, we have been looking at this uh, for a long time, for decades, uh, looking at different type of structure function or distribution function. And so instead of looking at the Bjorken X dependence, uh, for a long time, we are looking at something called moments. So this is something like pattern distribution sort of give you a 1D description of the uh, of what's inside the pattern. They could be um, they could be something the moment related to the uh, related to the uh, unpolarized PDF moment or the uh, different polarization uh, PDF moments. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you like a, the momentum fraction, that's the X. So the S I'm gonna talk about throughout today, it's going to be the momentum fraction, which is the particle you kick out from part time. Could be a gluon, could be a quark, could be an anti-quark, right? The momentum carried by that related to the original hadron, could be a proton, could be a pion, et cetera, right? So that's something we do a lot. And there's other observable called uh, foam factors. And you tend to observe this through elastic scattering. For example, if you have electrons kind of uh, colliding with the nucleon, but you're not breaking them, you have these photon interactions. And then you study some of the final state, then you can study the momentum transfers, and then you have various different types of the form factors. But the, you have, the, uh, here's the, I think the Ryan public form factor or actual and sort of uh, scalar form factor, if you have a polarized, of being then you study the initial structure. Then you got like another way of looking at the mystery object you are studying, right? And then lastly, uh, like a lot of people are talking about these days, something related to the generalized pattern distribution that give you a three-dimensional description of the object you're studying. Now you can really make out what Scotty is. And and then one of the nice thing it is much more difficult experiment, right? So I think in John's lecture he mentioned also like, this is deeply virtual content scattering, and there are other processes as well. You can study that, and that's much harder to study. But a lot of these general form factors that will give that can reproduce the earliest one-dimensional structure to my general structure, and most importantly, there are a lot of questions about photon spin. How does that come from? And 
as something that you can only answer to the generalized Python distribution function. All right, so, so how do we do that? So we, this is kind of semi review plus uh, how do we study the latest structure on latest QCD, right? So yesterday we talked about whenever you need to do a calculation, you need to pick a QCD vacuum, right? And then here uh, we talk about uh, the gauge and fermion action, like the continuum, you have to have first decide your single model action. But on the latest, because we had this discretized additional parameter or A, so in principle, you can write down very similar operator associated order A or either A squared, it depends on what kind of improvements and what physics you want to, you can make it more ideal for that. So you have very similar options. Uh, the vacuum can be generated with different kinds of quad flavors. I can say my up down quad to be, the up quad and down quad mass are so close to each other that sometimes we say the quad mass should be the same, right? You have a very small isospin symmetry Waking and they are certain most observable wasn't wasn't so sensitive to that so you can kind of you can know that for now and then you can put the you can just have an up down quark in the C or you can have up down quark plus a strange quark so that's two plus one coming here and sometimes people say two plus 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 one that means that you also have a chunk quark degree of freedom in the, in the vacuum right and you get have as the quark get heavier the effects gets much, much smaller. And that's why people are, a lot of pieces you're seeing today from latest calculations, either two plus one or two plus plus one. Yes. The plus ones, do they include the complex conjugate like charm, anti-charm, strange, anti-strange? Right, right, right. So, so you got all the, uh, basically all the vacuum, uh, uh, all the class com combination effects there. Yeah. And then you could have a different, um, so because strange and charm is so much heavier than light quark, so they are usually tuned directly at what the strange quark and charm quark mass should be. And so the thing that, that's more expensive will be the light quark. So you can still possibly have different uh, light quarks that make up the pi mass and that might be a little bit heavier than the real world is, right? And they could have the latest spacing, the uh, smallest distance on the theory that might vary and how big the box that will determine by what other vacuum you pick, right? Then like we saw yesterday, you will create, say if I want to study four times, right? So I will create, I put down my interpretation operators at a space, specific space time. And then I will start to propagate them just like what I did uh, yesterday when we studied the masses. But now I want to put in a Propagator, uh, operator, right? So you can think about this is like a plot, right? So you have you have a particle layer, you kind of need to interact with this so you can study the structure, right? So this is very similar to some of those Feynman diagram you look into, right? You have some kind of interaction operator and you put in layers. So you try to study them before I kill the, the proton on the latest, right? And so you would do same thing. You have to do all this propagator, which is required sort of a uh, pretty big supercomputer to do the calculations. Then after that, then I, so like that we actually, we will also study, we will integrate out all the space time, a uh, space, sorry, the space and momentum projections and, and all that, right? And then you end up with another, what we call correlator, is another Euclidean time dependence of series that we analyze to get the very different, uh, quantity where we're interested, right? So for the three-point function, say nucleon, in this case, this is something will be proportional, such correlator will be proportional to some of those overlap factors that you guys played around last night. And then it was some exponential turn, depends on the energy, right? So you insert a bunch of different, uh, from the ground state, here zero is just it means for ground state, and the one for excited, first excited state. So in principle, you can insert a bunch of one and expand them out. It got a slightly more complicated time dependent and principle it can go on for the second side state and third side state and so on, right? But like, like we see in the effective mass derivation yesterday, as you go on to the higher side state, the energy gets larger. So the, the effect sort of suppressed by the time, right? So one don't usually expect to see much stronger effect if you have, you, are, you put in a reasonable operator for ground state, you shouldn't get too, too much of contribution from higher ones, right? And so I was, and so, 
actually I'm just gonna do this one. So yeah, so so I was hoping to cover here yesterday. So basically you can use the same trick that you do with the two point correlator yesterday. Now you can do the same trick and then you can derive this formula as well. And again, you can think about the pion case, it's much easier. You don't have to worry about spinner. And if you have extra energy and time, you can play around with the nucleon as well. And so the time dependence itself doesn't really change, but the coefficient in front of each turn can vary, depends on if it's a pi on or, or the nucleon. And then, oops, okay, here, right. Then we, oh, maybe it's sorry, maybe easier to see from this slide, right. Then there's this thing called ratio plot. So yesterday we tried to see something called effective mass plot, where we, we find the time dependence and we try to compose something that will give us constant, right? We all know how to analyze constant. That's so easy. You can observe how things go. And that's something that we all train very good to look at, them, right? And similarly, we can also do something with the three point functions. So what you find is the observation, right? The ground state that you're really interested in is over here, right? So here's the metric Solomon I'm interested in. And there's this very simple time dependence here. So if I pick up my two point function at the exactly same time, right, I will cancel out the first term, right? And that will be say if I, my, my correlator is dominant mostly by the ground state, I will see a very nice plateau, right? And then there might be some residual type dependence somewhere over there. And then a little bit more suppression on the side to say, but this will contribute to some sort of overall constant because they have exactly the same time dependence, right? And then, so knowing that, so here's an example of what the, what the ratio plot look like on the lattice, right? So, so, I, so here there's another observable that we have is the, what I call source where I creating the nucleon and the sink where I kill the nucleon, right? And then you have this insertion time, but I can change that. I can always shift the time somewhere to be exactly at zero, just so I don't have to deal with three different parameters, right? So I simplify them. I shoot the source to zero. And the differences between them, I will call sourcing separation. So I'm going to write T as EP just for sure. And then the insertion time, I will call it a T, just again, easier to write this down, right? And so here's what I did. And I do this ratio. And so you want to make sure that one of the, one of the uh, big deals uh, issue that coming out in the last about 15 years also is we realized that for nuclear matrix Solomon, it's very sensitive to the sourcing separation, right? That's something we call excited to say. If you have large enough separation, you might likely to go do, um, your, your ratio plot will get somewhere really close to the true ground state you extracted, right? Because you, because it put them far away and the excited state will die out. The drawback of that is the farther the distance is, the data get noise in the nucleon. Right. So here's an example of multiple plots of the data from a small separation about one Fermi to 1.2 to somewhere 1.15. And you see the ratio plot sort of uh, if you assume this is, this is good enough, you're likely to get very wrong one set. Right, it does improve all the time as you start to increase the separation, but it does, you can also see that actually get noisier, right? So one of the tricks that we commonly do is we study multiple sourcing separation. So you vary them and you simultaneous fitting the time dependence to get the best result ever, right? So you do see the, if I use the same analysis, I only have one input, I got much bigger error bar for the true ground state. And the error bar does increase as I have more inputs here. And I also double check my understanding, our understanding that I'm actually getting the true ground state rather than a false state. Yes. And the, the pion probably doesn't have this problem at all, or am I wrong? That's a very good question. So pion at dual momentum, right, does, does not have the noise to signal issue. So what you can, what people usually do on the latest is put them as far away as possible. So you usually put them roughly halfway of the latest spacing, that's far as you can put them, right? And so for the demon, then you don't have this sourcing separation. Uh, so your signal will last very long because they pocket it much farther. But when you start to put in momentum in the new pions, then they will, they would, the signal will start getting like a little bit like nucleon. Sometimes 
it gets a lot worse as you go a lot higher momentum because the particle itself is so light. And then that momentum actually, you know, carry a lot of those information for the pions. So propagate. So they will be start kind of hit like nucleon and a lot faster. The, the signal is degrading a lot faster, actually. Right. And then, and then the last step of the analysis would be again we have to worry about a bunch of systematic uncertainties. You know there are some latest artifacts we need to remove them, right? And there are some additional trick, something called non uh, something called remizations, uh, that we need to handle that before we can take the continuum limit. And and typically, uh, the a very common choice that latest people make. It's usually about two GeV. Yeah. I don't know who's studying this. Uh, there are a lot of quantity that people just have a common scale. They like to compare different quantities. So sometimes when we don't mention specifically, it's usually renormalized or conversion to MS Bosky that you guys all learn from possibly field theory classes. And you convenient choice is usually about two GeV. Right. And then again, you do the same. Uh, extrapolation, if your pion mass is not directly a physical pion mass, you do the extrapolation, extrapolate the value to infinity of study, your quantity is not varied by that. And same thing with the latest painting measure, not affected by that. So you remove the monster in the latest calculation. All right, so, so here's a, one of the example um, that we look at, something called moment. So moment is one of those operators. I don't want to go through the duration that will be too long, but it's just one of those local operators that you can you saw earlier, right? So a good calculation, here's an example from a PND and me collaborations, right? So what you do is you calculate the same quantity, you calculate multiple pi masses, and then you calculate multiple latent spacing, and sometimes multiple value as well. And what you do is do a simultaneous uh, simultaneously extrapolation to physical pion mass and E or A. So here's one of the band. So even though we already have directly uh, calculation of physical pion mass, sometimes we don't have enough uh, QCD vacuum to have very good reliable calculation yet. And sometimes this extrapolation how to reduce the error bar a little bit still, right? So people still do that. And also you do, you always need to study multiple latent spacing and extrapolate to a continual limit, which is A equals zero, right? So this is typically uh, the, the requirement. If you try to do something reliable, then you say that we want to use that in experiments and, and maybe try to find out, you know, combination of that and try to find out, you know, what are the new physics or not. And that's something you do. But typically you also have a lot of latest QCD calculation. Um, so you have different groups we're using different Ensemble, some of them sometimes using less, some people using more, and so on. So, how do you, if you are a experimentalist and you really want to find out, oh, I, I really need to compare with a the theory calculation, I want to, but I don't know which one to pick. And so, here's this one of such things. Um, so, so, we have a workshop in 2017 in Cambridge. So, there we have a, 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 a two sub community joined together. It's like, as half of the participants from latest QCD, half the participants from Global Fit. And we try to talk to each other about what other quantity we do and, and so on. So it's not just you, students, like, I don't quite understand what latest people are doing. A lot of people who have been in the field for a long time don't doesn't know what latest people are Oh, the other way around, right? We don't, latest people don't quite know what another subfield they have been so used to, bunch of notation and all that, right? So this is a common problem, right? Even though we all talk about Moments, we think we, when we start to say, oh, let's calculate uh, such moments that what, what exactly is latest calculate, right? We calculate something called, as we take an integral from minus one to one. And that's something kind of strange for a global <clears throat> big community because for them, they always split the anti quark contribution to zero to one. So minus one is a weird concept for them. So we actually, the wrong side in that workshop and we saw that they, oh, there's a difference is on what we calculate and compare with them and so on. So this is a really common thing between when you start to quoting subfield, the notation that people get used to, it can be quite different. It's always good to talk about them. Yeah. Anyway, so, 
So the gist of that is solo. So, um, so if you want to pick a latest number, right? So if you're interested in what the latest say in terms of momentum fraction, which is n equal to two in this case. Um, so how did you find out? Uh, so what we were trying to do in this workshop is try to have a PDG particle data group like rating system. And if you're not familiar with the particle data group, you can think about like, I don't know, is anybody still using consumer report? Maybe yeah, review, Google review, <laughs> right? Something like that, right? So you start to rate. So you, you might not know all the details, but you look at the review, right? And so what we're trying to do is uh, there are very different systematic error that most people don't think about, but we have to worry about as a latest person, right? For example, I, I could have this clarification effect. That means that my, how, how fine our latent spacing is can affect the quality of our calculation, right? And whether we do a, a extrapolation or not, for example. And then we could have something called chiral, uh, chiral extrapolation effect. So if the pile mass is calculated very far away from physical pile mass, that won't be as reliable as the calculation that's done near the physical pile mass or directly at physical pile mass and so on, right? So finite value and and excited states and how we do the realization, et cetera, right? So, so to make it much easier for people who are not expert to, to look at this, what we do is we assign rating for different uh, calculation, right? So for example, if I look at common calculation is the something we call ISO vector combination, which is the aqua contribution to the, uh, to the portal minus downqua contribution to the portal. Right, and then we can see there are a bunch of calculation by different group at different years. They're using different kind of C. And so if you start to look at the, say if I'm interested in the strange, then the having a strange C could be important. But right now we only worry about UD quad, so maybe not important, we don't quite know yet. But we kind of just label them here. And then for the calculation that have good control, the systematic will give it a star, right? Just like how you usually rate. A restaurant or, or places, things like that. And somewhere maybe okay, they might be study them or maybe they assign a references to compare the result, you give a circle. And if they don't, you don't only have one latest spacing, for example, then we give a race star, right? So because we don't know how the latest artifact would be without studying them, right? Every latest is very, like say a different QCD backing is like its own universe. Uh, I, in my universe, I might, of particular setup, I have very small latency, but it doesn't mean someone else using completely different setup, they will have very small latency distribution effect. So it's kind of one of those things you have to start, right? So then, and then you can really start to compare them, um, citing all the different latest numbers. And then we are trying to compare with the global uh, community average result to see how well that are things that we can all re measure reasonably well and whether they have good agreement or not. And then you can go on to look at, you know, individual flavor, which is a lot more complicated. Now we have to worry about uh, something called this community diagram. I will come back to that if you have time. And then the, the strange contributions and the, the glue on contribution, right? So those are become more difficult and less people calculate them. And you can also see the error bar kind of increase quite a lot. But, but this is kind of a first attempt to kind of start to think about Right? You don't want just a legacy number, you want a good legacy number. Sometimes it may not be possible to have a calculation of all the stock, right? But you want the calculation that have possibly have, have more star, less the rate square as much as possible. So this is like the latest uh, consumer report if you ever need to pick a number from SSQCD. And then there's a, actually afterward, there is some sort of more global effort that's doing that. Um, I, I, I might get to that in a sec. Um, so then you, have, then you can make plot like this, right? So you can compare what this QCD does. Anytime you have a rate stop in your rating, you use an open point symbol, for example, then you can kind of like, this is something you might take a grain of salt. And then you can, you can compare different calculation uh, with a different flavor. And because they have very different behavior, so we have to separate them. And then they compare with, you know, what other global fit. But on polarized structure, you can see the global fitting uh, because they use like six decades of experimental data, right? So it's very well constrained. And, uh, 
And they actually, in most cases, they are quite precise compared with latest calculation. But then you start to look at the polarized structures. So for example, uh, here's one of the quantity that I mentioned in Ian's, um, Ian, yeah, Ian's lecture, right? Transversity, right? If we look at the moment of the transversity, and in here, actually, the latest calculation is basically the same amount of effort as we look at a polarized case. But it's very much because the global fit, which is at this bottom, uh, this panel here is actually a lot harder, right? Because it's much harder to have a very nice polarized uh, being as a polarized target to get a very clean measurement for the transversity, right? And then for latest in this case, it's the same amount of effort that we put in a uh, polarized uh, case. So you can see a lot of latest calculation actually a lot more precise, right? So this year I would say it's more of the, uh, complementary between uh, experiments and the latest, right? They are articulation that we do better, more precise, right? And the articulation that we are still kind of catching up in the unpolarized case, right? So, so in this case, we can actually mm -hmm. use latest input to improve some of this uh, transparency measurement. Yeah, and then here's also another example from the first moment. So to see such a bad Right. So one thing we tried a while ago with Alexi, who's not here, uh, is to try to include the transversity uh, distribution using just what we call latest uh, tensor charges. And this tensor charges is basically is the when this on this s complete uh, when n equal to one here. So basically, it's a uh, integral from this regions of the transversity distribution. So you can think about it like an area under that particular fiber this curve is, right? So we know the area very well. And we do, uh, we calculate the difference between aqua and dangqua, right? That's something that is still very well. We don't have to worry about a number of noisy things here, right? So here's one of the results that we, we have done at the time. So we pick up a few example data, right? So something called semi-elastic DIS, say so the data that they is one of the data set that people use to study the transversity, right? So without latest data, okay, this is a function of X, they got the d qua contribution to this function and u qua contribution to this function, right? So without the latest input, you got this bold yellow band um, from zero to somewhere large X, right? And with the latest constraint, what we do is basically constraining the area that way the parameter can go, right? That's the only thing we, we constrain the differences between aqua and dangqua. And using the latest input, it can greatly improve the uncertainty of the individual distribution, right? And so, so one thing is like, like I say, right? Latest was giving very limited information. We only get about the area. By latest itself, we don't know about what the shape should look like, right? Experiment data give us the shape. So all we do is really just constrain the area and combination of that uh, between the, global fit combination with experiment data and the latest calculation, you can get much, much better physics out of that, right? So this is one of the, the, the things that, that we can do with a, a bunch of different latest data. This H1 is transversity TMD? Or? Right, so, so I don't know if you guys remember that Ian have this table, have like a do by do table. <laughs> it's one of the diagonal. One over here at the corner, that's the transversity distribution. Um, right, so, so there are, so ever since we did that, they have been something called uh, flavor latest averaging group. So they have been generating this kind of report every two years. They don't include all possible quantity that they just calculate, but they just try to include a few of the the interesting quantity that a lot of people constantly have, like seeing people, for example, the, uh, there's something called sigma term uh, that could have the light quark contribution or strange quark contribution that comes into the, you can get a size, uh, some information about how big is the quark contribution mm -hmm. to the proton masses. They are also important to input in the dark matter experimental searches when you have to have some of the fundamental constant because everything interact with the atoms, right? The atoms make our well, nucleon in some sort. And so this become a, one of those fundamental constants that people need to use that and to interpret what the dark matter experiment, if they see something, 
and all oh, they use that to rule out certain uh, Beyonce and the model theory, right? And there are also very stubborn uh, charges. Uh, I don't want to go through all of that, but you can see there are a lot of quantity. Like if you're interested, you can look it up. Yes. Is there an easy way to say physically what's an axial charge and what's a tensor charge, or is it not easy? Um, uh, so the this glue doesn't do is they don't they 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 just take people's number and then they they just do an overall averaging. They, so they uh, so a, a nice um, you you can pick up numbers and you can try to um, I don't I don't I don't want to put this in the recordings. <laughs> Like yes. Physically, I just don't know what a tensor charge is. Forget the value. I don't understand what the thing is. Oh, you mean the, the quantity itself? Yeah, what does it mean? What is a tensor charge of something? Okay, so um, you can look at them differently, right? So if you so for us, what we calculate is a straightforward for us is we, we have a, the operator diagram you saw earlier, we have a tensor interactions, right? And experimentally, it's a little bit more complicated object. Right, theoretically, it's very clean, right? How we define that. Uh, actual charge would be we have actual current that interact with that. You can have a vector current, right? And so that, that's all something quite standard. And experimentally, it, it's quite different. Actual charge uh, doesn't usually come up with the QCD experiment. You usually, people <laughs> usually measure them, do the neutron decay. And, and then there's, they have this interaction diagram that you can turn out. Uh, tensor charge is also not a direct observable in the in, in experiment, right? That we, that's an integral of the transverse, transversity uh, distribution, right? So, so for that, uh, they, they, are quite, they can be quite, quite different, yeah. And then, um, right. Um, all right, and there are also things like bomb factors. Um, sorry, I missed out the slides here, okay. Yeah, there's also things like bone factors that people do major as well. There are multiple experiments that are going on. And this is QCD also did pretty well. This is one of the, also one of the very long quantity that we calculate as a function of transfer momentum. And all these calculations are directly done at physical half mass, right? So this is one of the quantity that we have, been, because they have been uh, long established all the experiment data and then people are still having uh, much, much in the large momentum region and small momentum region. So there are a lot of calculations on such quantity. There are also some interest in the actual form factors contribution, right? And so especially there are some application to the neutrino experiment, they, they tend to have input for the actual form factor as well. And so I'm going to up a little bit. And then once the form factor can also give you some of the, you can take uh, the Fourier transform of a uh, Bayesian Fourier transform of I can actually look, make out some of the nice structure for neutron and photon using the form factor. Yes. So do you compare this form factor with the experimental aspect of form factors or? Do I compare form factor with? From experimentally abstract form factor? With the experimental form factor, yes. Um, not in this plot, not in like this particular plot, but um, uh, I can find you another references. I don't have in my plot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, but, but the, uh, the intermediate region that we look at, this, uh, this region is actually, they agree reasonably well. The, the difficulty is oh, for- Well means, how, how can you say well? Huh? So when the feature is well, so. On what basis you are saying this region is bad? On what basis you are saying this region is bad? basis are you saying this region is bad? Right? So you have some verification that you verify with experimental structure form factors from your latest calculation form factors. How did you verify that? Yeah, this is reliable. Okay, so. This particular plot is, so, so we do a concern, again, we need to do a continuous extrapolation, right? So that, that's a, a different paper. Um, and I didn't put the plot here, right? And so you, so we can plot the, rate, we can plot the experimental other interpretation. There, there are a couple of interpretation people do for the, the electric, electromagnetic form factor, right? So we can compare those. And we can also compare with some of the data that we have access to. So there is a paper that I don't, I didn't have it in my slides. I can show that to you later, right? 
And then, so they are also other form factors, like for example, the strange contribution uh, to the, in this case, magnetic form factors, that actually the latest QCD has can done pretty well in comparison. And things are a little bit harder to calculate, such as hyperon form factor. So here, I didn't want to go do all this detail. I just wanted to you know, let you know that there are certain things that we can actually do pretty well on, on the latest, especially it's really hard to assess experimentally. Right, and then, um, I'm running late as usual, so I want to briefly mention the spin, how we do, how we contribute to the product spin, and uh, a little bit, and I want to talk, hopefully have time to cover some of the latest development in the latest case. So one of the thing that, one of the interesting thing is to find out the, uh, the, the spin, right? We want to know where the spin comes from in the proton. And it was a big question that's been mentioned a couple of times in this school already. So what latest people need to do is two types of contribution. One is, so this is a simplified version of what I showed earlier, right? We create a nuclear, we end on a nuclear, and we put in the operator, right? So there's this type of diagram, right? They, um, this, this can show up in different versions of the, the line, but this is just a Simplified version. And then of course, because everything is non interpretive uh, so they can actually have all the glue on interaction that I didn't show in, in my earlier diagram or something like that, right? So this is type of diagram we know how to calculate and they are numerically pretty stable, right? So if you want to start asking individual flavor, the interaction can show something like this, what we call this connected diagram, because now the operator is not connected to any of the valence propagated, right? It's, it's connecting to the gluon, has all the different you know, mm -hmm. loops of gluon that can be weird, C and all that, right? So this type of diagram is a lot harder to calculate. And they are, they, they have been very different technique that people have developed over the last 10 years or so. So we think we are kind of having a handle of that, but numerics, numerically still always, the quantity is always much noisier than this type of diagram, right? And then, what is a little blob on the, like the cross thing? On? This one? Oh, sorry. So this is really just the, the, the output we put in for the actual, if we are one, want to study, say, the spin, for example, that would be an actual current. So it would be just a gamma phi, gamma, uh, gamma z or something. Oh, as why. Right. So, um, so, so in terms of quark contribution, we actually, uh, so there are different type of diagrams and I just want to, sh I'm really wrong, wrong, low on the time. So anyway, so this is something that we have been calculating uh, with some of my collaborators for almost 10 years or something. So we made like, a lot of different finite value with bad like spacing and all that. So that's something we can do. And we can also, we started to look at the disconnected diagram as well. Here you see the magnitude is much smaller. So all this error bar is actually pretty large compared with the last earlier one, right? And then you can then yeah, sum them up. So you can look at the individual, how much is the individual quark contribution, right? By summing out these two type of diagram, right? So you can look at the individual contribution for the up quark, uh, up quark contribution, down quark contribution, and strange quark contribution, right? And here's similar diagram that we compare with what we know uh, from global field as well. And here, because the, the polarized structure is much harder for, uh, to study. Uh, so you, you start to see that there are much, much larger uncertainty in the global field rate than the latest calculation, especially in the strange sector. Right. And I'm gonna skip that. And they are also, so in addition to the uh, quark contribution to the spin, you can also have the orbital angular momentum contribution, right? So I don't want to go into a lot of detail explaining some of these operators, but just so that they are all related to the GPT moment um, that um, you can, you can I, I would you know, hopefully have time to cover that. So then you can start to look at the total quad and gluon contribution, right? So here's kind of the pie chart that's been done by two collaboration a while ago. Uh, one drawback is uh, one have very, kind of a little bit small value, another one have and your heavy quad masses, but they give us some idea or look like we see the U quad have the, both have the U quad have the biggest contribution. They did really disagree on how much the D quad is, right? Or how much the strange. One also relatively large, but not quite agreeing on the magnitude, right? And so that, that's one of the cases when you don't, you only have 
you don't have all those continual limit, right? So you are living and basically compare apple and orange because they are calculated in very different universe. So, but but there's a there's a way to improve that, right? So first thing we usually do is we make sure that we can do the calculation and then we improve that systematic. So that's something to be, you know, think, think about and watch out for future latest calculation. And then we can also do photon mass uh, decompositions uh, as well. So they are more detailed in these references and I have a slide of all the operator involved if you are interested, especially if we are theorist. Right, so again, you can look at the different part of the contribution, how much coming from gluon, how much coming from quad energy, and how much is very small percentage from the quad masses that we, we all know, right? Because up quad, up quad, up quad, down quad, AL2, such a small fraction compared with the photon itself. So a lot of them all coming from the energy itself. So, sorry about that. I'm going to quickly move forward. <laughs> So they, I'm just, I have a slide and then I have a few other slides afterwards. I'm gonna kind of go do that, but I just want to point out there are a lot of interesting application on all these different quantities that we look at, right? They had uh, the, like I say, the scalar coupling, the sigma pi and sigma s uh, do have application to the diameter detections. And the people have used that to rule out a bunch of SUSI uh, model as well. Large dipole moments, that we can you look at the tensor charge uh, contribution and actually calculate some of the older uh, five dimensional operators. And the uh, tensor charge and scalar charges also have application in terms of neutron, then some of the new non standard interaction in the neutron beta decay that actually help us to be able to pull multi TV range to effective theories. And then some of these transition form factors are also interesting. So I have. A number of slides. I'm going to skip that, but you can look at them, and I'm happy to talk to you about it later on. And I want to. Oh, and then we also take like one generalized form factor, but it's a very heavy quantum analysis, though. And so, okay, I have about twenty minutes. Okay. All right. I'm going to skip that a little bit. So I want to spend a little bit of time talk about. The part on distribution function, especially uh, the direct x dependence, right? We are now moving on from the integral and be able to do this directly, right? So again, there are motivations. Um, so just to remind you that the part on distribution function, it's a, a universal, it gives you the probability of finding the quartz and gluon in, in nucleon or pion in general, depends on where you study them. And then obviously there's a big interest in, uh, in IC as well. And so one of the reasons that really getting me into this business is the, um, I mean, we, we do know quite a bit of pattern distribution function from global analysis, right? So one thing I always have to correct students is there's no such thing as an experimental measurement of PDF, right? You don't measure PDF, nobody measure PDF. We measure, um, you know, cross section, right? That's the, the observable you look at, right? And so because you have all this cross section, you do, it's not just, you just directly match to PDF, right? You need a theory input. And so it depends on the data. If the data is really high energy, then you use a high energy theory to combine different experiments together, right? Because each experiment has certain kinetic regions, so you can only plot certain regions of the PDF, right? And, and then so if it's different input, you have some theory uh, to interpret them and together you come up with uh, best analysis of the PDF you can, right? So different combination of that can come up with a P different PDF set. You could have different way to parallelize uh, your distribution function. Some people use more general or even uh, neural net uh, PDF uh, for that. And some people have a systematic way of using, you can use a lot of physics symmetry to simplify uh, the parameter space for that, right? And sometimes in the cases you don't have a lot of data, Right, like the strange and the C distribution, and often you make some special assumption. Right, so one of the common assumption that's been used in the global field, but we don't know much about the strange, and we kind of just assume the strange equal to anti-strange, and sometimes just couple them with the cloud because they are all very small quantity. Even though this does not, it's not something uh, in physics inspired or anything, but the, the data is so bad, you can put anything; it will fit. So. Um, so that's something that uh, we are hoping that latest QC can do about them. I just gave you some ideas. So here's some of the graphs that sell them from this website, right? And different band really just a different 
uh, global PDF set, right? So just kind of, uh, that's all you need to know. And this is the, the SSS, again, is the built index momentum fraction. So you can look at, you know, say, is everything's average by one of the specific uh, analysis so that everything's normalized with one and you can compare the different magnitude, right? So one thing to notice, for example, in the data, in the region that when we have a lot of data, right, everything kind of agree reasonably, you know, the, all the band overlap. In the region that we don't have good experiment constraint, in this case, say, we need a, a larger X, and you start to see that the central value basically everybody's going all over the place because it depends on what assumption you use and get very different results, right? Similarly with say strange, for example, right? You don't really have a lot of information that outside the mid X. So let's call it points, point four. And so for example, blue one and the large X, the central value also move over the place, right? So, so generally when, so it's always important to compare people do, Different global fit group do come together and compare their their uh, global uh, PDF, right? Just sort of try to understand why it's causing those differences, and and they com compose a, a a kind of central set for experiment experimentalists or C or other uh, experiment to use, uh, but and so on, right? So we are hoping that the latest can actually contribute in some of those area. So you saw earlier, I mentioned that we have been doing a lot of things called moments, right? So instead of measuring the Bjorken S dependence directly, we have been using something called moments, right? And that's something, there are a lot of field theory involved in there that will take out another few hours. Um, but, but the just is that it's a local operator, right? And those local operators are usually well-defined under field theory, and we can calculate them quite straightforward, and there are a lot of continuum theories supporting that kind of operator as well. So that's what we've been doing, and they, are all, they also give us very good reasonable signals as well. Yeah, so we have the unpolarized along the chicken of polarized moments, and the transversely polarizing, right? And that experimental side, basically, you have the unpolarized, we, have, we, are, we know them a lot because most experiments give you some information on polarized structure. As you start to turning up the, how, how much polarized data you need, you start to get very lost information. And that's why the transversity or TMD is so hard that, that they had to have a theory collaboration to really think about how to solve those problems, right? And so on the latest side, one can argue, say, oh, but if I calculate other moments, I will be able to do an inverse transfer and recover some of this distribution, right? And this is where the, the symmetry breaking, uh, we had to pay a price, right? So some people are asking, right? You could have, can you have problems? Yes, we do have problems, right? As you go on to the higher moments, you start to see the operator miss with the lower dimension, especially one of those one over A operator. Right, and so that, that's a problematic. You can take continual limit and it's dead end, basically, right? And so for a long time, people have been calculating, you know, up to a couple, one first moment, second moment, right? And there have been some proposal to overcome this problem. Like probably somebody will come up with a different operator combination that cancel out all those one over A turn, right? In principle, you can play around with your math like that. And then some people try to get around it, uh, by different different tricks, right? And but it, it does also get noisier to go to higher moment, right? And then then when we are interested in the EIC physics, a lot of time we want to be able to assess the, the C and balance contribution. In the moment, they kind of all mess up together. So it's harder for us to separate them in a way. And that go beyond just the PDF, right? Uh, when I was postdoc, I was I was I switch it to do a structure kind of full time when I'm in my first poster. And then I just realized people tell me about this problem, right? And I was like, oh, that's so interesting, right? Because everything we do, not just part on distribution function, a lot of people are talking about journal rights, part on distribution function. Ian is talking about uh, transverse momentum distribution. They are all related to the same issue of what we can do on the latest for that. And they also things like Maison distribution function, or some people were thinking about five dimensional Winner distribution function, and they all come with the uh, limitations on that, right? So about 2000, um, right? So about 2013, I mean, there was, 
there were some uh, start, some people start, so for a long time, right? Uh, no, but no late calculation can do anything related to the built-in S dependence. It's all been done by people who are doing very different QCD models, Schengen Dyson equation, they do a lot of those calculation. People use a uh, very different uh, light cone approach. Uh, there's a, they probably have another one I'm missing. There, there were a number of different ways that they, they can ask, they can do those calculation, but we can't, right? And so, so this is, so until roughly 2013, uh, Shang Dongji, some of you might hear of him. Uh, he's one of the person who first introduced the generalized part-time distribution function idea. Um, so he come up with this idea of take away, uh, use latest to access some of the information for the part-time distribution function, right? So he proposed to, so he, he proposed to calculate. Uh, so there's a long story to that, and I don't have that much time. But basically, he find there was a, a spin crisis that people argue about early 2000 about how do you define spin, and there's different people come out different way of defining spin, and they don't agree with each other. So what's going on, right? Spin is something we should be able to observe that. And then it turns out they are working on two different frames. So all very smart physicists they got start with same kind of problem that you think a student will run into as well, right? So it turns out they were basically doing calculation, define their quantity in two different frames, right? If you all match them to the same frame, which is something called infinite momentum frame, that's where Feynman originally came up with this idea of part-time model, right? You just basically simplify your problem, it create, say, let's all think about things in infinite momentum frame, right? And that's where you simplify a lot of complicated diagram to something very simple. Right, and then, so he first, he was playing around about that and, and then he come up with this idea, oh, maybe we can also do the same thing with the latest, right? So why, why, he, have, why he come up with the idea is, so now we take, again, we take the QCD vacuums and we create nucleon, NLI nucleon, just like we would do with a general uh, structural calculation. But now we say, oh, we, we usually like to take the momentum as something very, as small as possible because that gives us the best signal, right? But now he say, no, we want non-zero momentum, right? We want as large as possible so we can get closer to that infinite momentum frame, right? And so that calls, that's, this is gonna come by us in a sec. And then also in say a local operator, right? So he proposed having this non-local operator, right? And then, and so, so we match sound in something we know how to do. Basically, you repeat the same step that you do with local operator. Now you have a, just a different type of operator, right? But uh, so now we want to control the separation of this, how much, how non-local we get. So you introduce another parameter, that distance. Uh, we, if you repeat this as a Z direction, that distance will be a Z length, just sort of laziness, right? So you have, very similar nucleon stay with a boosting momentum. And then you have quad anti quad operator. And now you, you could have a different gamma structure for um, polarized, polarized, and transversity, and so on. And then you have uh, some sort of a link that's connecting from here to here to make a gauge invariant. Right. And then, and then you take a Fourier transformation and we call something called quasi PDF. Right. This quasi distribution function will be depends on the momentum. Uh, in the calculation, right? And this is not quite the true Hadam distribution function, right? Because nobody tell you there's a moment independence, right? So this is not exactly that. And this can be linked to the true like home. So basically you're taking something like a momentum to infinity limit, right? But you remember the taking, every time you take a infinite limits, it's not trivial. It's a, a bunch of very different complicated things that's hidden in this something called something like a matching coefficient. So this capture a lot of those complications, uh, how you do all that, right? And then there are some residual, there are, it doesn't really reach all the problem, right? The larger the momentum you have, then you can reduce some of the systematic error, right? So a small X and large X, if your momentum is not large enough, you kind of limit how our calculation can impact on those PDF, right? So, yes. Yeah. Exactly why you cannot uh, compute the actual physical distributions on the lattice. Because um, what I've heard is usually that you can only compute equal time operators or something like that, but uh, I don't understand really why. Uh, okay, that, that's 
So there's a so this is yeah this is this quantity is equal time right so so this is not exactly the same thing it's not like home right you, you what like home is directly defined in the infinite momentum frame that it's not how our setup is right so we don't have that setup right if you want to impose like I say, I just do a field transformation to light forms, and then they will miss up the time and the spatial direction. Then you have a lot more complicated operator. Yeah, you have to include a lot of time dependence uh, correlators there as well. And then you have to worry about how do you, again, we are not, we never gonna, the way to take that particular infinite momentum limit will be also quite complicated as well. Right. And so this is not the only way of doing such a calculation. People are doing something. Uh, there are a number of different methods that are kind of part out about soon after that. They are very different methods. I don't want to, I don't have time to go do that. Uh, but you can look at some of these references if you are interested in. And so generally is what they are, we, this all proposed calculate different kind of diagram, right? There could be some, yeah. a pseudo PDF, quasi PDF, have a very similar diagram, but there are other methods calculate slightly different type of diagrams, but it go, goes to something that we calculate on the latest. Usually, it's a finite distance, uh, the quantity that um, different type of matrix sum when we calculate, mm -hmm. and then it will connect with either you want PDF, GPD, or different quantity with some some other uh, perturbative QCD matching kernel, right? And so, if you're using different method, you will quantity will varies between this purple block and the blue blood, right? And some of this can be quite complicated, right? And so each method is have its own pros and cons, depends on like you like to calculate. Um, so that's generally what we do. And um, so, so here is, this is a quick diagram and in terms of timelines of when this method was first proposed about 2013. So they are being, we are able to first look at some of this structure. You know, at the time, of course, these have a lot of systematic. You shouldn't take the diagram very seriously, but just sort of, you know, they are, they are first way of we started doing this different method, and they are multiple methods that are coming out at different times. And we just kind of marvel out that how much has been um, accomplished in the past 10 years. So they haven't been that much change in terms of how we calculate how to structure for a long time. When I was forced, I was like, oh, we're just going to do the same thing. But now we do finally spacing and boost semantic, all that. Yeah. I mean, it's still important, but just not as exciting. And then when these things are coming along, right? Oh, there's a new way of doing calculation, right? There are a lot of new quantities that one can calculate. And then my group itself, so I was, when I joined Michigan State, and my group actually done a lot of these first calculations. Uh, because it's so new out there, right? And it's, it comes pros and cons. Sometimes you don't have a good referee to understand what you're doing. <laughs> you know, and we run into problems that people was like, why is that a problem? And then five years after, oh, somebody gave it the fancy names and then we all say, oh yeah, that's what you run into before, but you know, things like that. But uh, so there was just a, a lot of really interesting thing, things that we never be able to calculate before. Suddenly we know how to, we don't know how to do it. Like I said, we don't actually direct calculate some of this, all this structure is sort of secondary from what we calculate in terms of matrix element, right? So there can be still quite a lot of systematic involved, right? So uh, I'm really low on time. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I just want to give a quick example of something we do with the global, uh, the CT group. Um, so one other thing I mentioned, like one of the, one of the a quantity that we don't know quite well is the strange distribution, right? It's so, it's so hard to have. You usually need um, like heavy, eye, heavy nuclei to be able to, to boost the signal to see something that's very, very small, right? And so here's that same diagram I showed earlier, right? So the assumption that people have done quite often is assume the strange equal to anti-strange, right? And, and, and so, so one of my former grad students uh, take a look into that, right? So it's really, it's harder to, now you have to worry about this, what we call the discontinuity diagram calculation, right? So when you look at the, the same, we calculate those uh, major Solomon, we can look at the real and major part, now the major Solomon is complex, right? The real major Solomon corresponding, giving us a, basically the differences or the strange and anti-strange times of cosine uh, some of these factors. Right. And what we find is actually 
it's actually pretty consistent with zero in all our calculations, right? And then if you try to put that into the global fit, okay. So if I put like using the same procedure to when I calculate the PDF, right? So I can get a, uh, sorry. Not, sorry, it's not in this diagram. Okay, so, so basically I use this and put the transform and go do that formula, right? So I get the distribution on latest, tell me how much is the strange minus strange as um, here is times by X just so that I can see a lot clearer. Um, so here's the tiny region that we saw that's basically consistent with zero-ish, right? And here's the uh, CTA analysis when, you, when they don't make that assumption, and you see pretty large uncertainty throughout the region, right? And so right now, and then let's try to implement latest constraint in this um, mid roughly 0.2 to 0.8. We try to avoid the, the small and large regions. And then they see some improvements, which is this gray black uh, slice region over here, right? So they have some improvement was not great. And so we are playing around if we can reduce the latest error bar by another factor of two, and then where that's where it get really interesting. You have this nice uh, green region that's much much smaller, right? So we so we currently have a plan to re reduce this error and by another bit or two. And one of the interesting thing coming out from this is the small S region that I mentioned. Our momentum is not currently large enough to see anything. I wouldn't trust anybody's number beyond point one, right? Some some collaboration might say they have smaller X pendants, but not quite. Um, Right, so you can see that I can only probably reliably look at some of this region only from the latest calculation. But if you combine with the existing uh, known experimental data, possibly more from LHC and EIC in the future, right? You actually have impact on the small X that we cannot calculate directly. So that's another complementary that we can provide some of this region that we don't have pretty reliable information from experiment and together we can actually have impact on small X or EIC. So that's something I really like about doing this type of research. And I'm gonna embarrass my student here. <laughs> Never go to a summer school with your advisors. So the bill here, we also started looking on the, we're also really interested in looking at the gluon, for example, right? And so we are trying, he's trying very hard to look at the continual limit. It's actually, Giving here, I think a lot of head and sleep this night to try to pull this out. But uh, but yeah, so so here we are compared. So most of the calculation only have one day one lady spacing. So we plug something that's comparable to that. When you do a continuous extrapolation, you do have a price to pay. Your error bar will increase quite dramatically, and that's what we show here, right? But there's a good potential that the latest calculation in this large S region can have a pretty good impact uh, compared with the, some of the global figure, which is have a bigger block here. All right, and then, uh, then it's, <laughs> okay. I, all right, so then just one last thing then. Um, so another thing that people are really interested in to really make out the uh, tomographic on the nucleon, right? Want to see how they look like, right? That would be like, if you have this, I, um, you know, if you say you are living in the Marvel universe, you have this quantum tunnel that you can get really, really tiny at a quantum level. I don't know, like the MN. Um, you, here might be what you was, you might be seeing, right, at the different x. So at a very large x, everything just kind of very small, right. And then you slowly increase the x, you start to see the the the, the impact space as y here, kind of symmetry. We look at the aqua differences and down, uh, aqua minus down aqua differences of the structure. Right, so there's some of those things that, that one can do with the latest. I, I can talk more about that later on. I'm just gonna skip all that. There are certainly things that's complicated, right? Like I say the large momentum price we pay as you go to, we, right now, we, most people can get to about 1.6, 1.7, right? Sometimes we get to about two GeV if you are heavy core masses, but we really want to get to five. So we are still a long way to go from there. Uh, so we can get down get to the larger X and small X at the same time, right? Things like they are a lot of signal to noise issue we need to improve. And then every time we deal with the gluon itself, uh, somewhere there should be, a, oh yeah, gluon. It's always complicated, right? So that, but that's something that, that would be really interesting investing because it's so hard to do that uh, clean extrapolation experimentally. 
And there are also things like inverse problem, which I want to talk hopefully a minute or so. Right, that I mentioned, right? Things we calculate, we don't actually calculate PDF, right? We calculate something like experiment, right? Like cross section, uh, we calculate metric elements that will somehow give us Python distribution function, right? And then they have some complication relation or depends on what you calculate, right? So it's not, so there is always a, of course, if when you have infinite information, maybe every in the ideal world, then you can do this very reliably. But unfortunately, we don't, right? But I have, I had do, I'm doing this calculation. I have this displacement. I can only go this far, depends on how big my box is. I can go outside of my box. That's my limitation, right? So once you go, but you do need that information to have a reliable contribution. Who knows how much, what the match sum will be outside that region. I don't know since I didn't calculate them. I can assume what they might be, right? But I don't really have those information. And because of that, you could have a very different determination of PDF. We would kind of basically go back to what global PDF analysis is doing, right? If you don't know those information, sometimes you might have to make assumption and all that, right? So that create uncertainty, right? So some of my students in my group was trying to use machine learning. Uh, so we are trying to say, let's assume that we know the distribution. We try to provide very different shape and, and all that. And we, we can do a forward uh, to guess what the what the metric sum would look like, right? So we train a bunch of data. And, and, then, and then when we get to a stage, we're really happy. Then we say, oh, let's finally put in the latest data and see what the machine would tell us. And so here's what we dig uh, at the time. So the, the circle, the green circle, the green bank here is what we do in this quantity called pion distribution amplitude. Um, so that's why we assume certain fit forms so we can get nice smooth. When we use machine learning, <laughs> uh, it gives us some of this very lumpy thing and so on. So, I mean, there's certainly a lot of work to do, but, but uh, so something would be nice to remove some of the assumption that we put in would be great. So that's something that some, some of you are asking what we do. Do these people use machine learning? Uh, this is one of the things that, that people are using as well. And there's, a, there's also, People using machine learning to improve how we generate those QCD vacuum. I say that's one of the very expensive calculation on the latest. And now people play around it, not quite exactly a three plus one dimension last time I heard about that, but it's getting there. Okay, so if you get nothing out of this to lecture, you should know that one of the things that's going on on the latest is we have been doing a lot of Hadron structure using latest QCD, right? A lot of calculations directly we are starting to what we call the precision structure. So we start to really, we need to start to think about the latest space independence, final volume and all that so that we are comparing the right universe with the experiment that are happening on earth, right? And then we also have overcoming the long standing obstacle that we are able to start to look at provide information, you know, indirectly related to the built-in S dependence, right? And there are various different methods that's going on. There are still some challenge, but I also like to think they are really good opportunity for you know young students like you can make a name of yourself to solve some of these problems. And then obviously, I think there are a lot of effort that going on to try to improve PDF and even GPDs. And you're gonna start to see more of the latest calculations start to play more important input uh, in, in combination with the traditional ones. And um, one, I think one more slide. Okay, that was going to talk about this yesterday. I think we get that far. So people, are, some still asking me, what do I wish you guys take away from this lecture? You know, you, even though you don't get anything. So uh, I will just mention this. You know, there's a, exciting things going on, so you should watch out. If some, especially some of our calculation may not be the good calculation a few years ago, people may have improved that by now. And you should get an overall picture about what the latest calculation is, right? There's this QCD vacuum. We put observable on there. We study the Euclidean time dependence, right? Things like that. Uh, I also want to point out that people tend to say, tend to treat latest QCD like Bibles, which I don't think you should, because it depends on how calculation is done. It can be a wrong number if the semantic is not examined carefully. So you do want to ask the question, right? Another thing I often heard people talk about is my, my experiment agree with latest calculation. 
But the question really is you need to say which one? I mean, a lot of, there are a lot of them, right? And even sometimes latest don't agree with each other if they are not everybody take that continuum limit, right? You, then you are not compared with the same thing, right? One, kick, one collaboration might calculate things in this universe. Another collaboration case, like another, you know, unless you all meet that in our universe, right? They are just different, colors. they are just apple and orange. So you should be asking those questions. And there are also limitations. We, we, we are not able to do everything, right? There are certain quantities we are just not good at calculating, right? And there are kind of quantity that we are good at doing. So you do want to kind of like, uh, so I think some people are saying, the latest is going to calculate everything. We don't need to do experiment anymore. Not true. They are even on the quantity we can calculate. They are they are regions and combination with the latest and experiment. That's where we can make you know toward um reveal the mystery of our universe together. So that's my takeaway message. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Up. You go to slide 83. Fifty three. Forty. Forty. Yeah, I, I just want to to get more insight on these moments here. Mm -hmm. Um, so the the longer arrow is the polarization, right? Oh yes. So yeah. these are the, 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 if this is photon, yeah, the nucleon, the nucleon polarization. And the smaller one is the quark. The quark. Yeah, so if that is the polarization, am I okay if I say that the first moment there yeah. has been averaged, they are polarized, uh, longitudinal okay. polarization? Uh, spin? Uh, spin averaged uh, longitudinal polarization, because I don't see, um, much difference with the second one there in terms of the schematic. There's a different by the size. So this is like you can basically have any possible orientation that. Yeah. So the arrow in the the longer arrow in the first one that's longitudinal yeah. polarization, right? Longer for the nucleon. For the yes. nucleon. And, okay. you're, and you're adding, mm -hmm. then you're subtracting. Okay. Yeah. So you, are, you actually care about the differences of the two. So you need a polarized target, a polarized beam to be able to distinguish them. First one, you don't care. You just kind of add up everything together. All right. It's like you can think about this like a polarized light and unpolarized light, right? You need like a filter. And then the filter on the experiment size, you either have polarized beam or polarized targets. So you can separate that polarized beam. And this one is like, you know, think about the light polarization, right? You can have all possible orientation. So most of the light we have is a polarized, right? Mm -hmm. well, on slide 40, when you're doing the um, uh, orbital angular momentum, uh, I think it was 40, am I wrong? 40. Oh, or, yeah. are you sure? I, maybe I'm wrong. Where we were doing orbital angular momentum contributions from the up quark, the down quark, and the blue one. Oh boy, I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So it's likely one of these slides. The early ones. The angular momentum is probably this one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay. So you have the polarization. You have the pol you have the, the spin of the the nucleon. So do I understand that this is how much the the up quark is spinning around that, and how much the gluon is spinning around that? Am I correct? Um, I mean, so of um, <laughs> so the yeah. So uh, the way we. We look at the, the total contribution from uh, yeah, the total contribution from quark can be quite you can think about increasing spin and then it's complicated interaction with your position vectors and the, 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 the well, operator itself. So this is one of those uh, contribution that give you the, the orbital angular moment. Yeah. And these charts are really beautiful, but it, I, I'm surprised that the up quark is the one that's doing the most orbiting around the right. Yeah. Um yeah, so well, so the way I think about it is just sort of because you have, you do have more valence 
up quad then. Yeah. yeah, but one thing I surprised is this two calculation have very different magnitude. For them. So that's kind of surprising to me. And uh, I don't think they are, they, they probably they are probably have some improved further calculation on that, but nobody have tried to do this. Oh, then, no, I think this is still the latest one. Yeah, I think they are, they are, they are trying to improve this calculation, but this is observable actually a little bit complicated to do. So they take time. Yeah. Yeah, total. Oh, right, right, the up clock, yes. Thank you. Right, 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 right. right. So yeah, there's a different way of people slice the pies and yeah. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, when one put things on the lattice, then in principle one should kind of break, at least for the moment, a whole bunch of symmetries like Warren symmetry, because... We bought the rotational symmetry. Okay. Mm -hmm. but but and then yeah, yeah. But basically, the question is like, all this, like to solve all these issues, is it enough just to take continuous limit, and everything will be restored automatically, or you need kind of introduce some kind of correction terms? Um, okay, so the rotational symmetry coming in many forms, right? One is we have all these possible order A turns. And that's okay, we can handle them. You know, can add them, we can take continuous limit. There are things that come in one over A, which is missing with the lower operator, right? Because that symmetry is broken, right? So you don't usually have this problem in a continuum. Now you have this problem on the latest, right? And there are ways to get around them. Uh, depends on how complex the observable is, right? Sometimes if you can, that's why some, some of the glue I mentioned earlier, they, they use something called chiral symmetry, symmetry fermions. Right, that you still have that chiral symmetry preserved on the lattice that would simplify some of the missing, some of the term which is forbidden after that imposed that symmetry. So some collaboration investing a lot of money, they are really, really expensive to preserve the chiral symmetry at finite A, right? Even though you know you go to continue it, the chiral symmetry should restore, right? But to preserve that chiral symmetry, you, you basically pay the price by using compute. You need uh, you know, like at least magnitude of five to 10 more computational resources than other people, right? And but if that's the only way you can get a business out, you know, you just have to eat up twice and, and do it, right? That's the cleanest way you can do the calculation. And what about translation symmetry? Like, because you have a boundary, right? So it's like periodic, you need to impose some kind of- Yeah, we usually do periodic boundary for the spatial directions. Yeah, and then, they, they are people play around with different boundary condition when they are special needs. For example, there are people, so the so the, the way we set up the latest, for example, right? We have, there's a, this minimum momentum that we can reach when you have the latest spacing and the volume, right? And then say, for example, if anybody wants to study the photon radius crisis or, or puzzle, whatever you call that, right? So the typical is, this momentum is minimally, you know, a few 300, and maybe it's quite typical. So there are a way you can play around with the boundary condition to come up with different momentum, right? Something called twisted boundary condition that allow you to reach to something that's not normally allowed by the periodic boundary condition by having some sort of twisting turns every time you cross that boundary, right? And then you have to work out all the correction because it does break break out some of the nice theory that we usually get familiar with, right? So you had to put in a bunch of correction. But, but if that's the way to get to the physics you want to study, then you put that out. Yeah. It's, it's more complicated, but yeah. It can be, yeah. So now all latest calculations simplify your life. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. uh, in page, I think, 58, you showed a movie uh, in a Slide 58. 58. Uh, yeah. yeah, so what is Vx and Vy and what is the color intensity stands for? If you oh, oh, okay. So um BSBY is like what we call impact space. So it's like a, so if you have like, if you are electron beams hitting electrons, right? So that's like you, the, the impact planes that you saw that you uh, perpendicular to you, where you move. So it's kind of that kind of picture, right? And then, so the X here is the broken X, right? So 
in the past, we can only see the integral. So when people do the moment, we can only see the integral of the X. You won't be able to see at which momentum fraction, right? So what you saw depends on how much momentum the protons have. So you see very different picture, right? And then the different color here indicating uh, roughly different density, right? So it's a lot more divergence. You know, things seem to be a lot more divergent singular at the small X and you get kind of really small as, as you read. It's much, much harder to be for the pattern to have big contribution as you approach larger momentum regions, larger X. It's like the probability? Yeah, probability density distribution. Yeah. A very short question, like there's recent papers, beautiful papers on intrinsic charm in the proton, and it works also for intrinsic strange, but there's predictions there that there should be a slight asymmetry in the SF, in the CC bar distributions and also SS bars. Would you be able to pick that up? Yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's something actually, I usually have another slide going with the strange, but uh, so we also look at the strange in the same, in the charm in the same paper. Uh, okay. I don't, okay, I don't have the paper here, yeah. Uh, so there's a paper. So when we look at the, the the strange, in this case, we also look at the charm. And charm of contribution is another magnitude, of, at least another factor of 10 surprise. So everything is really small as well. And so we, in this particular latest, we look at uh, it's it's um, so it's roughly uh, the it's the latest spacing itself. If you translate into GEV, it's really close to the charm. We do see something that's consistent with zero, but we are not saying 100% confident that we never see the CC bar. So one thing I was looking at, I never have time to do, <laughs> is to, to input the calculation with a much smaller latent spacing. Yeah, so that's something that's in my pipeline, but I haven't got around with it. Yeah, so the Jennifer mentioned is, is a very nice article on nature about this charm asymmetry is also a big discussion other people as well. Uh, on slide 60. So is this pion distribution is like a, a proton, proton? Is it like the, is that the PDF for pions? And is that what it stands oh, for? Oh, yeah, actually. It it's a little bit complicated. No, it's not quite, it's not a, like a payang payang. It's like, <laughs> you can, the closest thing uh, might be related to say, payang wave function. You might want to think about it like that. So it's actually, uh, an operator would look like, uh, so I would display, it's actually what we call two point functions. You will have the payang uh, displaced by a distance with another payang, and then you analyze them uh, to the vacuum. So it's more like give you some information related to uh, the pion itself. You probably have uh, people use the distribution amplitude to look at the complicated decays. So that's another thing we can do very well on the latest is to have multi hadron right? So I'll, I mentioned a little bit, I put in some backup slide for yesterday's slide, if you want to see about that, that when we start to have two final hadron state, it, things get a lot more complicated to calculate, right? That's also another thing that comes in more complicated when we break that rotational symmetry that you have your, your two hadron final state get really complicated, right? Like every time we have a light time, light time, we just integrate them out, right? So that's one of the nice things. But with a two hadron, two QCD final state that get really complicated. You have to worry about a lot of contribution. And because we bought the rotational symmetry, you got a lot more possibility that coming up. So to do that, it's much harder. So one of the things that you can get around, they have been quite a number of effective theory. If you know well with the pattern distribution amplitude that give you single pi on information, you can combine with other effective theory to study some of those pi, Pi pi or pi other hadron final states. That's one of the application. I, I can show you some of the diagram later if you like. No question. So let's thank Hyvren. Uh, it's time for us to have.